You're listening to Policy Currents, a weekly podcast from the RAND Corporation. I'm Evan Banks. And I'm Deanna Lee. Every Friday, we bring you new insights from RAND's latest research and commentary. It's October 8th. A four-day school week is becoming more common, especially in rural parts of the western United States. Champions of this approach say that it saves schools money, improves student attendance, and helps recruit and retain teachers in rural districts. To learn more about these potential benefits and the drawbacks of a four-day school week, RAND researchers examined data from dozens of districts in six states— Colorado, Idaho, Missouri, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and South Dakota. The findings point to trade-offs. Here's an overview. Saving money motivates districts to choose a four-day week more than any other factor, but empirical estimates suggest that a shorter week would save less than 5% of costs. However, some district officials reported larger savings, and many stressed that even small savings were meaningful. Students with a four-day school week missed fewer days than students with a five-day school week did. However, the proportion of missed school days over the course of the academic year was similar between the two groups. In terms of student achievement, students' test scores in districts with four-day school weeks improved more slowly than they would have if the schools had maintained five-day school weeks. And it's worth noting that these effects would accumulate over time. Both parents and students in four-day school week districts were enthusiastic about having an extra day off, valuing the additional family time that a four-day schedule brings. This study, the largest of its kind to date, highlights important data about the effects of a four-day school week. It may help education leaders and other stakeholders weigh which outcomes matter the most when considering the shift to a shorter school week. Since 9-11, the paramount goal of domestic intelligence collection has been to prevent terrorist attacks. The campaign has been largely successful. Authorities uncovered and thwarted more than 80% of jihadist plots because tips from the community, information from informants, or boasting on the internet brought plotters to the attention of the FBI or local police. But now, after two decades of focusing almost exclusively on the threat from global and homegrown jihadists, the United States is pivoting to address domestic violent extremism. And according to RAND's Brian Michael Jenkins, a renowned terrorism expert, the model used in the campaign against jihadists is not the right approach. Prevention may be more difficult to achieve for a variety of reasons, he says. For one, there is no galvanizing event to unite the country around a common cause. The January 6th attack on the Capitol has not created the same level of alarm and anger as the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center and Pentagon. Political partisans can't even agree on whether it was a worrisome event. And unlike jihadists, domestic political extremists have a potential constituency here in the U.S. In fact, The beliefs motivating America's domestic extremists, especially those on the far right, run deep in American society. This means fewer tips from the community can be expected, and informants may be harder to recruit. Additionally, today's politicized atmosphere will also make prosecutions more difficult. More cases are likely to come to juries where just one sympathetic juror can cause a mistrial. For these and other reasons, Jenkins says it may be time to rethink U.S. strategy when countering domestic violent extremism. Quote, while intelligence could be a critical component of America's counterterrorist strategy, there are reasons that it may also be wise to return to a more traditional approach that focuses on investigating violent crimes and bringing perpetrators to justice. In 25 U.S. states, motorists accused of excessive speeding can face either a criminal misdemeanor or a traffic infraction. And which charge you face is at the discretion of law enforcement officers and the courts. In a new study, RAND researchers examined nine years of data on speeding violations in one such state, 
Virginia, and they found large racial disparities in who was convicted of a misdemeanor. More specifically, the data revealed that black motorists were more likely than white motorists to be charged with a misdemeanor instead of an infraction. Additionally, black motorists were almost twice as likely as white motorists to be convicted of a misdemeanor. And while most people convicted of a misdemeanor for excessive speeding won't go to jail, there are other repercussions. For example, fines. The average fine and court costs levied for a misdemeanor conviction in Virginia were as much as $120 more than for a traffic infraction. And misdemeanors could show up on a background check, potentially affecting one's ability to get a new job or obtain a lease. What might be done to address these disparities? The researchers provide some recommendations that could help ensure speeding laws are enforced in more equitable ways. One potential solution is statewide automated speed enforcement. This would reduce the potential for officers to engage in disparate treatment and would ensure that motorists in different counties are policed in the same way. In such a system, cameras identify vehicles that are speeding above a defined threshold, and citations are automatically issued to the vehicle owner. The debate over the legacy of the U.S. war in Afghanistan is just beginning, and there are many important questions to be answered. Why did the United States lose? Who was to blame? And what comes next for Afghanistan, for the U.S., and the world at large? For RAND political scientist Raphael Cohen, one particular question stands out the most. Does the United States still have the grit necessary to fight and win long wars? Cohen says that the answer is not immediately clear, but the will to fight will be central to any future conflict that the U.S. may face. Quote, Without it, the hardware of war, all the planes, tanks, and ships, is meaningless, and all the clever concepts are simply theoretical. Cohen says that even under the best circumstances, future wars would likely be a Herculean test of American willpower. A war with China over Taiwan or Russia over the Baltics would be militarily far more difficult than the war in Afghanistan or Iraq. And the economic devastation and casualties of these future wars could be orders of magnitude greater than what the United States experienced during the global war on terrorism. Not to mention, victory in these future wars is more uncertain than was victory in Afghanistan. America's will to fight may remain an open question for now, but what's at stake is clearer. The sake of the international order and the fate of liberal democracy could depend on it, Cohen says. RAND is a nonprofit institution that helps improve policy and decision making through research and analysis. For more on what we covered this week, check the show notes at rand.org/podcast. We'll see you next week.